Thank <laughs> you. 
दोनों अपने आप वेकल चाह रहे हैं दोनों लड़कियां तो मिली हैं इसके लिए ये वेकल चाह रहे हैं पर उनको देखा नहीं अच्छा लगता है मैं भी शिवार में लोगों को एक बार देखा था कि वो बिल्कुल ना पता कर रहे हैं नहीं पता कर रहे हैं वो देखा है लेकिन उसका उसका क्लियर फोटो हाँ ये भी थोड़ा सा पतला देखो कितना 
Yeah, video on. Hello, Dr. Bibek. Hello. 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 Hello, Dr. Bibek. Yes. Sir, good afternoon. Sir, good afternoon. To hear you. you can hear me? Yes, sir. Absolutely clearly. Sir. Okay. Can I check my uh, can I check my slides? Absolutely, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We can play. Okay. Let's check the slide. Post test or labels. Post is disabled is a sharing the screen. Post to disabled participants can share. They have to enable. Can I share my screen? Vivek? Yes, sir. Disabled, it is written disabled. Now you can try, sir. Can you try now? Yes. No, no, yes, no. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So it's okay, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So two o'clock I'll join. Two o'clock I'll sure. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm.
बाकी सर लोग का तो जब आएंगे बस उनसे टिकट खोलनी सर को अच्छा
मिसेस तिवारी को भी बोल दो
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and the residents of Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, I, Dr. Namrata Sharma, welcome you all today on the occasion of the 54th annual Foundation Day celebrations of our center. I request Professor Atul Kumar, Chief RP Center, to accompany our esteemed Chief Guest, Professor Randeep Guleria, Director, Ames, New Delhi, on the dais. And I invite Professor Ramanjit Sihota and Professor J.S. Titial on the dais. I request Dr. Shreya Nayak to welcome our chief guest, Professor Randeep Guleria. Dr. Navneet Sedu to welcome the chief RP center and president, Ora, Professor Atul Kumar. Dr. Ananya to welcome Professor J.S. Titial. Well. 
we would like to welcome mrs tiwari wife of late for former chief, chief dr h k tiwari for being, for being with, with us today, today and for sparing the time we welcome, we welcome the senior, the faculty, senior faculty, faculty members from aims and rp center in this august uh, gathering and we and we we will begin we will the begin program the with program the invocation, invocation recite uh, uh, the invocation, the invocation recital, recital as as we are we, we, uh, we, uh, we each year each year is recited so much so much which symbolizes, symbolizes the power of our center of darkness to light प्रथम किरण जलाते हैं से जग प्रकाश से जग प्रकाश में करने को है हम तत्पर करने को है हम तत्पर करने को है हम तत्पर तम सो मान नहीं है रवि प्रखर रात के तारे नाम हर अंधकार हम दूर भगाए अंधकार हम दूर भगाए माटी के दीपक बनकर माटी के दीपक बनकर माटी के दीपक बनकर तम सो मां हो क्यों कोई नर मंद ज्योति कोई हो क्यों कर हम प्रकाश के पुंज बनेंगे हम प्रकाश के पुंज बनेंगे ज्योति जलाएंगे घर घर ज्योति जलाएंगे घर घर ज्योति जलाएंगे घर घर ज्योति जलाएंगे घर घर थैंक यू मिसेस पुष्पा रमेश प्रसाद मिसेस अभिलाषा प्रसाद एंड मिसेस परवीन फ्रॉम द नर्सिंग डिपार्टमेंट फॉर दैट इनवोकेशन रिसाइटल आई रिक्वेस्ट द डिग्नेटरीज ऑन द डायस टू प्रोसीड फॉर द लैंप लाइटिंग सेरेमनी and now it is time to present a short movie on the activities of rp center tamsu ma jyotir kamaya from darkness to light dr rajendra prasad center for ophthalmic sciences was established by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India in 1967 as a national center for ophthalmic sciences to provide state of the art patient care to the common man 
Dr. L. P. Agrawal, the founder chief of the center, was a visionary who envisaged a standalone comprehensive ophthalmic center that would be at the forefront of the eye health planning, academics, and clinical care. The center is a constituent ophthalmic services unit of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. R. P. Center is spread across a standalone seven-floor building as 300-bedded facility catering to a footfall of more than 5 lakh patients per year. Dr. R. P. Center has the largest ophthalmic residency training program in the world with over 250 ophthalmology residents training in basic and advanced ophthalmology with 40 several faculties comprising of six clinical units of excellence catering to different ophthalmology specialities clinical services to retina and uvea cataract and refractive cornea and ocular surface ophthalmoplasty and ocular oncology squint and neuro ophthalmology ophthalmic anesthesia and ophthalmic related basic sciences of community ophthalmology ocular pharmacology and microbiology this center is also one of the leading facilities in the country publishing medical literature on clinical and basic sciences research Unit 1 caters to cataract, refractive and pediatric cataract services along with retina and uvea services. A large volume of children of all ages with cataract is examined and operated upon providing them with optimal visual rehabilitation. Unit 2 caters to retina and uvea along with ROP services. All advanced and complex retinal surgical treatments are available. The special pediatric neonatal unit caters to comprehensive ROP services for the premature babies with retinal problems. Unit 3 caters to cataract and refractive cornea and ocular surface services. World-class facilities for femtosecond assisted cataract and refractive surgery is performed in high volume throughout the year. Unit 4 caters to glaucoma, squint and neuro-ophthalmology services. Advanced care facilities for glaucoma clinical, laboratory and research facilities are accessible to all patients. Unit 5 caters to squint, neuro-ophthalmology and oculoplasty services. Children and adults with a wide variety of squint problems and complex neuro-ophthalmology disease are thoroughly examined and taken care with the world-class surgical procedures. Unit 6 offers to cornea and ocular surface, cataract and refractive services along with ocular oncology services. State-of-the-art facilities in corneal transplantation with all recent advanced surgical procedures, keratoprosthesis services, and stem cell transplantation services are possible here. Ocular oncology, inclusive of comprehensive retinoblastoma care services is provided. I congratulate the RP Center, its residents, its, uh, faculty, and all the staff who have helped the RP Center through its 50 years at some time or the other. The RP Center has grown due to the efforts of everybody here who contributed in their own small way for the entire growth of the center. This is a major achievement and its role as an epic center in the country is so well defined because of this extremely good work. And so in this 50th year, I feel so proud that even WHO has recognized us and we are uh, fortunate to have the national program of the Government of India and WHO with us to undertake all the blindness related activities besides the clinical work we are already doing, the search oriented work which we are already doing at RPC. This is a major achievement for us. 
and in the future i as and uh, foresee expansion of rp center which we are already uh, it's on the in, it's in the maps and we hope to soon have an expanded rp center in the next few years I now invite Padmashri Awadi, Professor Atul Kumar, Sir, Chief RP Center and President of Thalmic Research Association, to present the report on the academic and the research activities of the center over the last one year. Respected dignitaries, Professor Madan Mohan, uh, when I first joined in 1981, he was the chief of the center and just after Professor P. Agarwal had retired. Though I was in touch with Professor P. Agarwal, but uh, I first faced Professor Madan Mohan as the first chief when I joined as a junior resident here. And Professor Kavita Sharma, whom I've known since many years, and she's uh, avidly interested in the well-being of the center, being the daughter of the founder director. And uh, she keeps asking me what all we are doing and everything, and she's very keen. And she always is ever willing to come for the RP Center Foundation Day, just like Professor Madan Mohan. Yeah, I mean, it's taken for granted if Professor Madan Mohan is coming and Professor Kavita Sharma is coming and Mrs. Tiwari is coming. So it's like, you know, hum, the fondness for the place where they grew up, at least grew, grew up from, it, uh, from its inception. So and Professor Tiwari is, of course, I remember so well, he was my mentor, teacher and guide, my thesis chief guide. And so Professor Mrs. Tiwari, I welcome you, ma'am. And of course, our uh, very dynamic director, Professor uh, Randeep Guleria, who's ever uh, helpful and always there with us to support us in our endeavors in the IE Center at RP Center, being a constituent of the AIMS. And we always look up to him for advice. And, and sometimes you may be making mistakes, but I really would like to apologize. It's never uh, deliberate. It's just that we tend to do things to improve the general population state, uh, ophthalmic hygiene, health, preventive medicine, and the curative medicine. And uh, all the senior faculty, the junior faculty, the residents, the optometrists, the staff who have all contributed to the growth of the center and will continue to do so. So I'll just quickly go through my short talk. We've had the message from the Honorable Health Minister this year, and he's been kind enough to tell us that he's very happy to know that the RP Center is celebrating its 54th. Then the Health Secretary, Mr. Rajesh Bhushan, who recently took over last year in the COVID uh, a pandemic period and soon after and then he's been very uh, uh, he's been very he's laudated our good work and he's thanked us and of course our ever uh, supportive director professor Randeep Guleria who has given his message congratulating us for this wonderful day which we celebrate as part of the aims sir i would uh, all the dignitaries i'd like to inform you that once again in 2020 we were ranked number one in the top 17 eye centers in the country. This is when we have major private centers like LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, Shankara Netrale, Chennai, Aravind Eye Hospital and PGIO, Postgraduate Institute, which is spread over seven, eight cities, the main center being at Madurai. Narayan Netrale, which is basically hubbed at Bangalore. Then we have Shankara Eye Hospital at Bang Bangalore, the Postgraduate Institute at Chandigarh and uh, Sankaraya Hospital also come. So that's 17 hospitals top ranked by week. And we, the RP Center being constituent of AIMS is number one on overall performance, including work related research and patient care. And this has been something which we maintained, sir, in the last uh, three, four years, five years, and I'm sure it's continue, going to continue. So it's a heavy competition we face and you can easily get superseded very quickly. But we maintained it, and uh, we were we got the WHO recognition uh, way back in sixteen. But then, twenty twenty they renewed it to twenty twenty four. So they felt that we the kind of work our community of ophthalmology, but led by Praveen, but Dr. Praveen Bhushan, Dr. Praveen Bhushan, and the others are doing in clinical work and researches to the mark to their level, and they would like to renew it. You've got six units has been told to you, sir, and we have various unit in charges as given here who. And Professor Mandeep Bajaj has taken over on the retirement of uh, Dr. Professor Mother Pradeep Sharma. And we've got basic sciences are very, very supportive to us. Professor Nishat Ahmed was a node law officer for COVID. 
and this uh, this dynamic lady has worked uh, 24 hours 24 7 for the last year and this year for all many ensuring that we have a safety and uh, protection against the dreaded disease and of course pharmacology is by dr velu pandian who has designed so many innovative techniques and junior residents for 2021 the faculty group photograph and the ayushman bharat so we've number of beneficiaries who taken advantage is 418 in the january to december though the cases were low because of the covid but we could give the assistance worth over 53 lakhs and we've been making our own guidelines sops professor tanush dada helped a lot and then uh, professor velu pandian was so innovative he came up with his face shields and sodium hypochlorite hand sanitizers and all this we could make in house and this work works out extremely cheap and it's Something what the Prime Minister has been emphasizing, the Atman Nirbhar, which is very, very important. We make our own uh, things which we don't need to get and buy from the market and buy from abroad. So this is the kind of solutions you made with proper stickers and everything. And uh, for external use, freshly prepared and they're given to the various wards and the OPD area. We maintain very safe and clean OPDs thanks to the medical superintendent and his team and the medical social workers of RP Center who really work in 24-7. Early morning, their WhatsApp starts on. AIMS COVID WhatsApp group is separate. So they they really tell you what all they're doing in the morning. We've got May, make I help you. And we've got these special donning and doffing areas. And of course, our residents, uh, the dynamic residents which we have, they uh, even COVID positive patients operated at the trauma center of AIMS. And some injuries which are uh, you can't kind of uh, neglect, ne neglect them, the open globe injuries were operated. By four of these are COVID warriors of RP Center of AIMS. And uh, here you have these four of them. One of them is Akshara. I can see some names, Dr. Nawajish and some are Manish. So three names I can identify. So we've been with the AIMS as part, integral part of the AIMS in the vaccination drive, which the director is so uh, kindly initiated himself. And uh, most of our residents are getting, uh, and the faculty is getting vaccinated. and we. We were because being the frontline health workers. We got the largest postgraduate training program. In 2020, we saw about 1,51,000 patients. OPD and specialty clinic, 1,93. And missions were about 20,000 over. Surgeries were 21,000. The research is continuing, and all this helped us to gain the rank one. In peer reviewed index journals, with 378 journal uh, articles in peer reviewed index. So we're continuing our teaching program. We've not put a stop to it. and we. Uh, I was very particular that uh, teaching should not stop the residents are doing their MD. It's important that the education continues because if you put a break, then they, they don't know what is happening. And it's important even their surgery has now been restarted, the cataracts, everything. So we had a number of education programs. Professor Ramanjit had a very good lecture on diagnosis and prevention of glaucomatous morbidity. And uh, Professor Pravin Vishnu, the national program. Professor uh, Pradeep Sharma on paralytics, business, what we should know. All these was through the set facility of AIMS, which is excellent. And I would say that the AIMS set facility really gives us a way that we can give out, uh, deliver our lectures and during the COVID period. So we had the eye donation four times celebrated by Professor Detyal and which the Honorable Health Minister also part participated virtually from the, ministry, from the ministry. And then we discussed about diabetes, it's worsening and it's retinopathy. And also the World uh, Retinoblastoma Week was was basically the health education was given. So we had these monthly workshops which are very popular with the country. And um, ophthalmologists from all over the country like to uh, log on. And because of the COVID, we have a virtual workshop. And here you can see the Professor Pradeep Sharma conducting the Strabismus, Dr. Ramanjit, the, Professor Ramanjit, the glaucoma workshop. And all these were really they are highly appreciated with a high number of ophthalmologists from all over the country, both learning, teaching postgraduates, as well as the uh, practicing ophthalmologists, they refresh themselves. So we've had, as I told you, on the 25th of August, 2020, we had the eye donation fortnight with the Honorable Health Minister, Professor Titiyal and uh, Professor, the director, uh, we were all there and we uh, sadly so bid farewell to two of our leading senior faculty, which is Professor Pradeep Sharma, head of Shabismas and Neuro Ophthalmology and Professor Shakti Gupta, who was the MS. They super on the first month of this year. 
despite the covid uh, thanks to the academic section and all that we we've, we've held our major md exams in time and of course we maintained our high quality of care in the in our ots and everywhere in the quality of technical expertise we have the kind of surgery you can perform is unsurpassable sir which is actually true with the surgeries which we do is are still probably world world class here because of the equipment and the uh, the techniques we employ that not only the machines help but the technique which we employ also help. and refractive surgeries also smile and elastic have been done very nicely and headed by professor titial community related we are doing work despite the covid uh, professor pravin vashist and his team are doing the national survey on human resources infrastructure for ik services in india it is strengthening the refractive error and prespa of your programs in india because this is a major issue of people uncorrected refractive error in the uh, uh, you know in uh, not so well educated class and they don't know that they, they need glasses so vision spring is a very major uh, ngo in the us and they were very they came over and they were very keen that they should have this refractive error correction program and they've been doing this in other countries so we also have a television tele rehabilitation for people who are visually handicapped zoom platform and we try to give them education information psychological counseling psychological is very important and uh, also all of us so in the end i just like to say uh, uh, just a word on the our motto which was coined that tamsoma jyotirgame is actually oh lord from darkness darkness lead me to light and this is the shanti mantra from the uh, bhadra naika upanishad and this so well tells us that this is a duty towards the lord almighty that give us the strength and courage that we can lead the people from darkness to light thank you so much thank you sir for that uh, inspirational address and for your dynamic leadership over the past years which has made rp center the best i care facility not only in india but the entire asia pacific region i now request professor guleria and the esteemed dignitaries on the dais to release the souvenir of dr rajendra prasad center for ophthalmic sciences which is an overview of the accomplishments of our center during the last 54 years Thank you, sir, and the dignitaries on the dais. It is a pleasure now to request Professor J. S. Titial, Padma Shri Awardee and Head of Cornea, Cataract, and Refractive Surgery Services, to address the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. Namaskar. Very good evening to all of you. I would definitely like to pay my tribute to my alma mater, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center of Optimistic Sciences for giving me this opportunity to be standing in front of you in this August gathering. Indeed, it's truly my pleasure to be amongst you for today's occasion, that is 54th Foundation Day celebration of Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Optimistic Sciences. First of all, I'd like to pay my regards to my teacher, my mentor, Professor Madan Mohan, who has been a constant source of encouragement, learning, and getting us to a right path for so many years. And his presence every year in this August gathering is really heartfelt uh, moment for us. Thank you, sir, for being with us for a, such and such a long time. And I hope uh, you keep coming to us and give us 
much more encouragement for future also. My greetings to Mrs. Tiwari. My greetings to uh, Mrs. Kavita Ji for being with us today. And the dignitaries present on the dais, our chief guest, Professor Andeep Guleria, the director of AIMS, chief office center, Professor Atul Kumarji, Professor Ramanji Suhota, the senior most uh, professor in the center, and Dr. Namata Sharma. The people who are present here today in the gathering and people who have joined us today online for this particular occasion, I give them a warm, warm regards and thank you for joining us today. And I know that the large number of people sitting are our staffs and my dear students. Firstly, I would like to really congratulate our director, Professor Andeep Guleria, for his illustrious tenure during his, which our institute has scaled new heights. Being the topmost pulmonologist in this country, Professor Guleria has been a constant source of inspiration for his colleagues and students. The past year was full of unprecedented challenges and changes. He has been a heart of the national COVID response and has played a key role in promoting public awareness and dispelling the myths related to pandemic. In fact, you'll be surprised to know his book, Till We Win, India's Fight Against the COVID-19 Pandemic, became a national bestseller within a week of its publication in last month, December 2020. We are indeed fortunate to have been led by a visionary like him in these trying times. In the last few years, if you saw the video of RP Center, RP Center has truly prospered under the able leadership of Professor Adul Kumar, a world-renowned vitro retinal surgeon, dedicated clinician, a true academician. His excellent work ethics and untiring efforts towards the patient care, even at the peak of pandemic, has been an inspiration to all of us and our students. I believe none of this would have been possible without the unwavering support provided by his family. And I would definitely like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation and thanks to Madam Mrs. Parul and his son. Professor Atul Kumar has made great efforts to boost the teaching curriculum for a postgraduate teaching in the RP Center and especially the sub-specialty workshop RP Center, which has been so popular, not in the center, amongst the entire fraternity of ophthalmic people in the country. His vision to improve the patient care by incorporating cutting edge technology has played and helps us to stay up to date with the newer technologies, the therapeutic advances in the field of ocular diagnostics, surgery, and treatment. Director, sir, in this context, I would like to call your attention to a few aspects of pertaining to our center. The physical structure of our RP center is nearly as old as the main aims and has served the apex center of ophthalmic services to our country and Minister of Health and Family Welfare for the last 50 years. While it was the first center to be developed within the aims, no expansion has been undertaken thereafter to increase its capacity while many centers and blocks with modern state-of-the-art facilities have come up in the vicinity of Ames campus. The continuous increasing load of patients, which we have seen in the video also and last year's report, has created a severe crunch of space in RP Center. The much awaited new master plan of the Institute is in its final stage of development and refinement. We hope that due consideration would be given to our petition for increasing the space and infrastructure facility for RP Center. I must say, people in Ames believe that RP Center is self-sufficient in terms of space and manpower, which is a myth. It's not true at present time. Our OPD caters to several thousands of patients with a large number of procedures and surgeries are being done daily uh, there is an increasing need for the expansion of OPD block, commencement of a newer OT, which should be dedicated to daycare surgeries and facilities. At this present structure of RP Center, I'm not sure if it could withstand the pressure of load of patients for the next few years also. 
I strongly believe that it would be better if RPC is, is relocated to a new site with a separate tower that can accommodate all necessary modern state-of-the-art facilities in this master plan. In the meantime, some expansion of the existing facilities would help us to cope with the patient care, teaching and research in RP Center. There is an immediate need for a transition from the physical document-based system to electronic medical record system, which with its numerous advantages into a better patient care and data management will definitely help our future research in RP Center and make things much more authentic for our research and patient care also. Adequate training facilities are important for any area to build a workforce, not only for the Institute, for the entire country also. We have been a forefront of orthopedic research and care in terms of the largest residency program in the Asia Pacific area. There is a definite need of increasing the super specialty training in RP Center in ophthalmic branches to create an MCH in ophthalmology as well as MSc in optometry is the need of our. At present, there is a serious shortage of manpower, especially in terms of uh, staff nurses in operation theaters and wards, as well as operation technicians also. And we know that optometric uh, help from a technician is one of the major challenges we are facing. And this is in the pipeline. I'm pretty sure Director Sir will look into this regard also. The National Eye Bank House and RP Center is one of the leading eye bank of this country, which has helped our country decreasing the coordinated blindness for the last so many years. While the COVID-2019 pandemic did create a major setback to medical treatment area, but major casualty has been the eye banking as such. We are struggling to reach up to even a 10% of what we used to do last year at this particular time. In coming years, we have to redouble our resources, our efforts to reach up to the present scenario, which is so much a backlog of a coronal blindness requiring surgery as such. The Ames Delhi Hospital Coronal Retrieval Program, the Ames Delhi SCRP program has been a great success, which is a major source for a donor tissue, not only for Ames, for the entire Delhi and they are partner eye banks and hospitals. We have 10 counselors working under us for in these major hospitals of Delhi, which are supported by a service project funded by NGO, and this funding will end by 2022. And there's a dire need of creating these posts in the RP Center National Eye Bank so that we can sustain this project for a longer period and make National Eye Bank self-sufficient. Dear Director, sir, for the future of RP Center and continuation of highest quality ophthalmic service in the AIMS, we require your constant support and blessings. I shall end with a few lines of uh, some uh, important things. We should be proud of ourselves that we have come so far to live our life. And we should be proud of ourselves that we can go so far to live our life. It is difficult, it is not easy, but we are not going to be able to do it. We are not going to be able to do it. We will not be able to do it. We will not be able to do it. कदमों को न बांध पाएंगी मुसीबत की ये जंजीरें रास्तों से जरा कह दो अभी थके नहीं हैं हम अभी थके नहीं हैं हम I again wish a very happy Foundation Day to all of us and congratulate all the awardees for today and wish you all the best for the future and keep your COVID management and precaution with you all the time. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for your address and for your inspiring words. In an endeavor to recognize the best students, staff, and employees at RP Center, prizes are given each year through the Ophthalmic Research Association. I request our honorable chief guest, Professor Randeep Guleria, sir, to give away the RP Center awards for the year 2020-2021. The best senior resident award this year is jointly awarded to Dr. Gunjan Saluja, Dr. Mohammad Ibrahim Asif, and Dr. Abidnya Survey. Dr. Gunjan Saluja is working as senior resident in the Oculoplasty and Strabismus Services in Unit 5.
Dr. Mohammad Ibrahim Asif has worked as senior resident in the cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery services in Unit 3. Dr. Abidnya Surve has worked as senior resident in the lens and the retina services Unit 1 at our center. Each year, ORA gives two gold medals to the students who top the MD exams. It is my pleasure to announce that for the July session 2020, the recipient of the MD gold medal is Dr. Navneet Siddhu. For the December session 2020, the MD topper is Dr. Ananya Goswami. Beginning from the last year, the Glaucoma Research Award has been instituted in the memory of late Sri Janardhan Prasadji, father of Mr. Janesh Nandan, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Defense. The second Nora Glaucoma Research Award goes to Dr. Karthikin M., who is working as Senior Resident in the Glaucoma Unit for his outstanding contributions in the Glaucoma Research. The Best Junior Resident Award this year is jointly shared by Dr. Aishwarya Rathod and Dr. Abhijit Benewal. Dr. Aishwarya Rathod, sixth semester resident, is also the former ORA secretary. Dr. Abhijit Benewal, a sixth semester student, has also been the former ORA secretary. The award for the best PhD student goes to Dr. Shahzan Anjum, who is currently doing research on molecular characterization of malignant lacrimal gland tumors. She is currently working under the chief guidance of Professor Seema Sen in Ocular Pathology Department of our center. The award for the best student in Bachelor of Optometry is jointly shared by Ms. Aarti Gautam and Ms. Darshita Sirohi. The Mrs. Lily Kalia Memorial Award for the Best RPC Operation Theatre Nursing Services is shared by Ms. Densimal Jaman and Ms. Sushma Singh. Ms. Densimal Jaman, Senior Nursing Officer, has been with us in RP Centre for the last 21 years. Ms. Sushma Singh, nursing officer, has been working in the RP Center OT for the last 10 years. The Best Nurse Award in the Ward Services is jointly shared by Ms. Rosalie Vargas and Ms. Suman Lutra. Ms. Rosalie Vargas, assistant nursing superintendent, has been with us for the last 34 years and is currently posted in Ward 3B. Ms. Suman Lutra, Senior Nursing Officer, has been working in RP Center for the last 21 years in the ward and has played a key role in the eye banking activities. The Best Nurse Award in the OPD services is jointly shared by Ms. Pushpa Ramesh Prasad and Ms. Rajini Prasad. Ms. Pushpa Ramesh Prasad, Assistant Nursing Superintendent, has been in RP Center for the last 28 years. And Ms. Rajini Prasad, Senior Nursing Officer, has been with us for the last 24 years. The award for the most efficient Group A staff in the administrative services goes to Ms. Saroj Pant, Administrative Officer, who has been in administration at AIMS for the last 36 years and has been with RP Center for the last one year. The award for the most efficient staff in Group B is conferred on Ms. Harbans Kaur Uppal, personal assistant who works in Unit 4 with Professor Ramanjit Sehota as of now and has been with us for more than 30 years. The award for the most efficient staff in Group C is jointly shared by Mr. Shyam Singh and Mr. Narendra Kumar Nagar. Mr. Narendra Kumar Nagar, Senior Administrative Assistant, is currently working in the chief's office and has been in RP Center for the last 23 years.
and Mr. Sham Singh, hospital attendant grade two, has again been with us for almost last 35 years. The award for the most efficient staff in Group D goes to Mr. Ravi, nursing orderly, who has been working in RP Center for last seven years. And now it is time for the COVID Appreciation Awards. It is my honor and pleasure to announce the honor certificate for COVID control to Professor Ramanjit Sohota, who is the chairperson of RPC COVID committee and has done commendable work during the COVID pandemic. At RP Center, face shields, masks, hand and surface sanitizers and liftman keys, etc., for the frontline warriors were developed in house by uh, Professor uh, T. Vail Pandian and his team from our ocular pharmacology department. We acknowledge their efforts in facilitating many innovative initiatives at RP Center during these trying times. Our nodal officer of COVID-19 infection control and contact tracing committee, Dr. Nishat Hussain Ahmed, who's also the member secretary of COVID-19 committee, RP Center, has worked relentlessly in guiding and teaching us the don'ts of COVID-19 pandemic. She helped in training more than 600 healthcare workers and also helped in making the SOPs. Ms. Sonu Rani, senior nursing officer, has helped to recommence the operation theater services in the COVID era, and you would like to recognize and applaud her efforts by giving her the COVID Appreciation Award. Thank you, sir and ma'am, for doing the honors. It is an honor and pleasure to request our chief guest, Professor Randeep Kuleria, Padmushri Awardee and BC Roy Awardee, Director Ames, New Delhi, who has been the torchbearer and has spearheaded the COVID war in the entire country to address the gathering. Thank you. Good evening. Professor Madan Mohan, Amu Chief RP Center, Dr. Kavita Sharma, Dr. Mrs. Tiwari. I think all three of them really highlight what RP Center is all about. Their passion for seeing the growth of RP Center is something which is remarkable. Every year they're here to really support the RP Center in the activities they're doing and see it grow. So I think they, we need to give all three of them a round of applause. Thank you very much for really supporting and building the RP Center. Professor Atul Kumar, Chief RP Center, Professor J.S. Tityal, Professor Ramanjit Sehota, Professor Namrata Sharma, Dr. Daga, my other faculty colleagues, presidents, students, ladies and gentlemen. At the onset, let me really congratulate the Dr. Rajinder Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences on its 54th foundation day. 54 years is a huge number of years for any institution to have really gone through. So I think this is really remarkable and shows how ophthalmology has evolved in these 54 years and how the RP Center has played a pivotal role as far as this evolution is concerned. And I was thinking how ophthalmology would have been 40, 50 years ago as compared to what it is today. Probably at that point in time, we did not have that much of technology probably an ophthalmoscope, a torch, and using your basic clinical skills was all that was done. Surgery would probably be just predominantly cataract, glaucoma, or treating trachoma. But at that point in time, the founding fathers had that vision that ophthalmology is going to change and become such a large speciality that they invested 54 years ago in building a center like the RP Center. That itself is truly visionary. 
and then to sustain it to the level it is today is also something which is remarkable. And I think that this is part of the entire AIM story that we are so proud of. And from that, let's say, small department of ophthalmology to a center where you're now having really high-end technology to help you and doing things which could be like phacoemulsion, LASIK surgery, retina uh, treatment, vitreoretinal surgery, corneal transplant, or oculoplasty, and then to have subspecialities now. We had six units, but there are so many subspecialities which have come up and have grown over these last 54 years. But they've grown and become what they are today because of the vision that was there more than 50 years ago. So I think we really need to salute the visionaries who really set up the All Institute of Medical Sciences and set up the RP Center. And RP Center has really excelled in all the three trinities of mission that AIMS was given. And that was patient care, academics and research. We all we already know how sought after the RP Center is as far as patient care is concerned. Professor Atul Kumar showed you that it's rated number one as far as the hospitals are concerned. We have to just go outside and see the long line of patients coming from all over the country as far as patient care is concerned. And that's why it's ranked number one consistently by various independent agencies as far as specialty is concerned, even by the week in 2020. As far as academics is concerned, it has grown and become the largest postgraduate teaching program in the world. But it's not only the number that is there, it's the quality of care and the quality of teaching that it provides. Because there has been a lot of debate as to that there are so many ophthalmologists being produced, but are they of equal standards? Is training the same as it is in one area as compared to the other, let's say in the private sector as compared to the government sector? in a state hospital as compared to RP center. But RP center has led the way in training students, postgraduate students and others, even senior residents in how to really become true academicians and then use that skill to further develop such, such areas, both in the government and private sector. So it has really excelled as far as the areas of academics are concerned and work to enhance the resident surgical skill by having a state-of-the-art National Ophthalmic Surgical Skill Development Center, which really helps the residents to, you know, tone their skills, become confident in the procedures they have to do. And that itself is also something which is really remarkable. The RP Center has also done very well in research, and that is something which is also uh, well known. You just have to see the number of publications they have, and the type of high-end research that it's involved with support from various departments like ocular pharmacology and others which are working with them uh, and pro uh, providing high-end research. So I think they have, RP Center has done remarkably in these last 54 years. And over and above that, we had the challenge of COVID-19, which really put everything in a different perspective. Patient care suffered, academic activities suffered, and so did research. But I think it was the resilience of the entire healthcare community in our country that came together and showed that no matter what be the challenges, we can overcome them. And this was shown not only at the All Institute of Medical Sciences, but across the country. A lot of things were done to meet these challenges whether it be providing patient care. And I know that at, uh, at our center, at the All Institute of Medical Sciences, all departments, all centers came together to fight this pandemic. Residents who had no idea, I, I know that residents from the RP Center got posted to the COVID area. They were ophthalmologists, but now had to manage pneumonia. One resident told me that I had never really interpreted an arterial blood gas and now I'm expert in analyzing and, and interpreting AVG. 
because that's I've been doing that for the last so many months. So they learned how to manage pneumonia, critical ill patients, but they didn't say no. They really took that as a challenge, despite the fact that they hadn't come here to really learn those skills. They had come here to become specialists in some other areas. Also, academic activities did not suffer. A lot of newer or innovative things in terms of tele education, virtual classes were started. The RP Center itself started this monthly virtual RPC workshops, which was very popular among the residents. And a lot of online lectures were started so that the academic program did not suffer. The academic section helped them in terms of providing the necessary support and the exams were held on time. Also, the hospital came together. We converted our National Cancer Institute into a COVID hospital. We converted our trauma center into a COVID hospital and created more than 1,700 beds dedicated to COVID patients. And during the month of July, August, we had more than 900 patients admitted who were COVID positive in our hospital and we managed them. And many of them were critically ill, had comorbidities, but with our resources, we were able to manage that number without really uh, having a situation where we said that we can't take any more. So we had created a facility of 1,700 beds. Luckily, we didn't cross the 1,000 mark because at that time, point in time, in July, August, the predictions were that we would really have a huge spike and India would have more than 2 lakh cases a day. We didn't go more than, we have were less than 1 lakh cases a day. But that was the prediction and then we prepared for that. Similarly, a lot of innovations came through. The face shields, our in-house uh, sterilization uh, material, even projects of recycling PPEs. A whole project was done, which is submitted as a paper where when there was an issue of shortage of PPEs, how can we recycle personal protection equipments, N95 masks? So can you create a room where if this PPE is in good condition, can you hang it there and using a fogging machine, sterilize it and then repack it so that it can be used again? This was done in a very scientific manner and shown that it could be done. Luckily, we didn't need to do that because the country came together and a lot of people started making PPEs which were being imported initially. And now we're actually exporting personal protection equipment and N95 bars. So I think the last one year has been full of challenges, but full of stories of how we overcame these challenges. And that was truly remarkable. Talking of challenges now, RP Center has done so well. What are the challenges that it faces? And I think those challenges are something that we need to keep in mind because this is the challenges that our forefathers or the founders of this center kept in mind and then planned accordingly. So we have to really see what we can do in terms of the future. We have to develop strategies for prevention of blindness. And I know that during COVID time, the National Eye Bank really had a huge setback, which we need to really see how we can do a catching up as far as that is concerned. The right to sight is something which is envisaged that we have to do. And that is another thing that is paramount as far as ophthalmology is concerned. But a lot of technology is coming in. It was coming in in the past, but it's coming in more rapidly. And how do we really adapt to that? And a lot of things we've seen are possible thanks to COVID-19, because we technology was used so much in terms of telehealth, in terms of teleeducation, in terms of teleconsultation. And now there is so much that is being looked at in terms of, can we do online eye examinations? Do, do this, does the patient really have to come to the hospital? Can you have uh, digital contact lenses, which will be able to not only look at various other things, but monitor the body in terms of even looking at things like blood sugar and other things in a, in a person and be able to transmit that to a device where it can be monitored for an individual. 
genomics is coming in in a big way as far as medicine is concerned in terms of being able to diagnose diseases early and many retinal diseases for that matter. Robotics in surgery. And then we have this whole issue of 3D printing that is now really ready to take off. So do you think we could have a lot of biosynthetic corneas in the future? And that will really take care of the problem that we have in terms of uh, shortage of corneas. So I think those are things that we need to look at and see how the RP center can really take off in that direction. But we also need to look at the challenges we have as far as a population is concerned. We are having now an aging population and that itself will lead to increased visual impairment. India has moved from the burden of disease being predominantly communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. And almost 60% of the burden of disease now is non-communicable non diseases. And diabetes, hypertension play a big role in that. So what can we do as far as the say, diabetic retinopathy or other things are concerned? Can artificial intelligence come there in a big way? I remember a project which was being done. I think it was in Kerala where they were looking at a smartphone camera being attached to a device and that could look do a retinal scan in the community and be able to diagnose whether there was retin, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Also using a similar scan, there was a project I saw, which was I think in Belgium, where they were able to look at the retina and using artificial intelligence, not only look for diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy, but they were able to diagnose atherosclerosis early or looking at the arterioles and venules, uh, venules, uh, veins in the retina, be able to even look at diseases like Alzheimer's and other things. So there is a lot that science and technology has to offer. And I think that is where the future is. And we as scientists and, and as leaders in this area need to start seeing how we can start adapting, adopting, and preparing for all these things. Medicine in general is moving very rapidly and we have to move with that change. Considering that in mind, AIMS is having planning a master plan where we plan to expand our hospital. That includes the RP center. The Eastern Sarinagar will become predominantly a hospital area and the residential area will go to the Western Sarinagar with apartments coming up so that we have more houses in the given land that we have. We also have some area given to us behind the trauma center, which will also become housing and apartments in terms of more houses being available. This will really help in resolving the housing issue as far as faculty and other staff is concerned. It will also expand the campus to a really health university. Our aim is not to have a large hospital with many, many beds. Our aim is to really have a health university, a medical university, which is a hub for research, a hub for academic activities. And that leads into better patient care. So we would expand. It doesn't mean that we're going to expand to have more and more beds or more and more hospital area. We will need to develop more research area, core research labs, translational research labs, more academic activities for the future, and also look at having a digital platform so that all our health records are digital and then a lot of research is data driven. That is also something that we need to do for the future. So I think we have to plan for the future. We're trying to do that. I'm sure RP Center is also on that. And it's a very exciting future. I at sometimes envy the young generation because the type of change in things that they're seeing is something that our generation didn't see. And that is something which is phenomenal. But it's also something that means that they have to be on their toes throughout because you can't sit back and say that what I read five years ago is not relevant. It may be irrelevant and you'll have to read and stay in touch. Maybe 30, 40 years ago, you could say that. You can't say that today. So it need, means that you have to stay in touch with changing times and changing knowledge as far as health and medicine is concerned. So once again, let me congratulate the RP Center on its 54th Foundation Day. The future is very bright.
And I think the path that you've taken is going to really lead you to great success. And I wish you the best for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your address, uh, for your time, and for immense contributions and encouragement, not only for the growth of the center, but for the healthcare system in the entire country and community at large. On this uh, momentous occasion today, uh, it is now time to felicitate and thank our chief guest, Professor Randeep Guleria, Director Ames. May I request our chief RP center, Professor Atul Kumar and other dignitaries on the dais to please felicitate him. Thank you, sir. I think we need to give a standing ovation to our director, Professor Randeep Guleria, for leading everything all the way against the COVID war. And also to Professor Atul Kumar, sir, Chief RP Center, for working tirelessly and relentlessly without a break for a single day during the lockdown and the post lockdown period. Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Professor Ramanji Triota to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, I thank all of you for coming here, but I think the most important thing is to, uh, to put together what the, the director has said. He's acknowledged that we have come a long way. He knows the challenges, and I think we can all hope that in future, as he has in the past, we are going to have his unstinted support and his encouragement in everything that we think we require at the RP Center. Thank you, sir. An event like this uh, takes many hours to organize, especially within this period of, of COVID. So I think we've had the help and support of many committees, people, individuals, teams, both from RP Center and AIMS. I won't name individual people, but I'd say that the CMET was absolutely extraordinary in getting the excellent posters done. Mr. Ravi Grover and his audiovisual team for this uh, experience. Mr. Gopal, Mr. Narendra from the chief's office and all the other administrative officers for their organizational help. We also have the RPC engineering section, the AIMS engineering section, those from the Jawaharlal Nehru auditorium who actually have helped put this uh, together without pausing, uh, we hope, uh, a COVID sort of um, uh, rush. And uh, the security, horticulture, sanitation, and the delicious sweets that you're going to soon have from uh, Gupta Sweets. Finally, I would like to thank the core organizational committee, which consisted of chief, uh, the faculty, residents, and all the staff of RP Center for first, uh, just being there all these years, and for being there for the last year through this very difficult time, and for the support towards making the RP Center the best of Thanmic Hospital in the country. I hope we're going to go forward and make it the best in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your vote of thanks. At the conclusion of the function, let us all rise for the national anthem. जनगणमन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड पुत्र बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे 
जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू एवरीवन after this now we have the oration program the scientific session and i would request uh, professor tanuj dada to please take over the deliberations बाकी ये आ जाएगा सर आ जाएगा सर मोटा हो जाएगा ये वाला ऑल द रेजिडेंट प्लीज बी सीटेड फॉर वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट दी ओरेशन प्रोग्राम ये वाला दे दो ये वाला रेडी है रेडी है रेडी है ये कहां शिफ्ट नहीं हो रहा हां आप मैं करूंगा हां स्विच पे बात करो स्विच पे बात करो स्विच
हाँ रोहन क्या कह रहे हो हाँ सबको बुलाओ इस सर को कॉलर माइक we are going to start the rp center scientific program for the 54th foundation day i would request all the residents to please all come inside effort. and take the seats all your effort so this year the prestigious rp center oration has been conferred upon professor jyotirmay biswas he is the director of the uvitis and ocular pathology department at shankar natale chennai and also the visiting professor at the advanced eye center pgi chandigarh 
and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is a world-renowned ophthalmologist, the first one to describe ocular lesions in AIDS in India. He has contributed to three books on uveitis, one on ophthalmic pathology. He has won 34 awards, including the prestigious Hari Om Ashram Award from the Medical Council of India. To his credit, he has 417 peer-reviewed articles, 47 chapters, and has served as a reviewer for over 36 journals. He is the principal investigator of over 13 research projects. And to his credit, as a leading person in the field of ophthalmic education, he has mentored over 43 uveitis fellows from various countries, including Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Kenya. We welcome Dr. Jyotima Biswas, and now we'll have the RP Center oration from him. Sir, please come online. Thank you for the kind introduction. At the outset, I'd like to thank and express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Atul, Atul Kumar, Chief of the RP Center and the Organizing Committee for giving me this honor of delivering the prestigious RP Center oration. I feel quite humbled, privileged, and encouraged to get a residency in the RP Center, the Apex Eye Center in the country is a dream for many young aspiring ophthalmologists. I was one of them. Today, giving this oration is a special occasion to me and lifetime honor. I thank everybody for this encouragement. I like to start with a quotation from T.H. Huxley, which says, the known is finite, the unknown is infinite. Intellectually, we stand on an islet in the midst of ocean of inexplicability. Our business in every generation is to reclaim a little more land. I'll be talking on retinal vasculitis. At the outset, I like to mention that this work was not done by me alone. My co-researchers in Shankar Netrala in particular helped immensely in doing the research work. I'll be sharing my experience of three decades on clinical and basic research of retinal vasculitis. Outline of the talk is basic pathobiology of retinal vasculitis, causes of retinal vasculitis, our research on Eels disease, and our research on other causes of retinal vasculitis. Retinal vasculitis is the inflammation of the retinal vessel, which is located in the inner plexiform layer of the retina. Periphlebitis is much more common than periarthritis. Eels disease is the most common retinal vasculitis in India. Retinal vasculitis can be divided into the five categories, primary example Eels disease, associated with uveitis, associated with the collagen diseases, associated with infection and associated with neurologic disease. The way I approach, I ask the question, I ask, is it retinal vasculitis alone? Is it ocular alone? Is it associated with systemic disease, autoimmune or infective? This is a fundus picture of retinal vasculitis showing retinal vessel inflammation in the mid periphery. History dates back to 1880 when a Henry Hills a British ophthalmologist from Birmingham described the clinical picture of recurrent retinal hemorrhage in young adults. Henry Eels believed it to be a vasomotor neurosis and not retinal vasculitis. Wordsworth subsequently described five years after the signs of retinal vasculitis. Eels disease is a primary retinal perivasculitis, occurs in healthy adults between 15 to 40 years, predominantly male, almost 80%, mostly seen in Indian subcontinent. Once we used to see one in 135 ophthalmic patients at our institute. However, it has reduced a lot in recent times. It has got a characteristic natural course. It starts with the retinal vascular inflammation, followed by ischemia, neovascularization of the retina or optic disc, 
fibrovascular proliferation leading to the vitreous hemorrhage and fractional retinal detachment. Our research on Eels disease dates back 25 years. When we asked the question, does Eels disease occur in active systemic tuberculosis? We went to Tuberculosis Research Center in Madras and made a makeshift ophthalmic center and studied 1,005 patients with active pulmonary and 108 extra pulmonary tuberculosis in that hospital. Complete ophthalmic examination, including indirect ophthalmoscopy was done. Interestingly, no case of Eels disease was done, seen. We published our results in international ophthalmology in 1996, ocular morbidity in patients with active systemic tuberculosis. Subsequently, in 2017, when we studied the high resolution CT chest, we found about 50% of the patient had latent tuberculosis. This is a high resolution CT chest showing tree in bud appearance suggestive of latent tuberculosis. We had the opportunity to study the histopathology and immunohistochemistry of ill disease specimens comprising of epiretinal membrane and subretinal membrane. Epiretinal membrane in ill disease when compared to the other vascular retinopathy, we found epiretinal membrane in Eels disease had vascular channels, which is surrounded by lymphocytes, whereas the epiretinal membrane in proliferative diabetic retinopathy did not have such lymphocytic infiltration around the vessels. Subsequently, we did the immunophenotyping of this inflammatory infiltrate in epiretinal membrane and subretinal membrane in Eels disease we found they are predominantly pan T cell marker positive and fairly faintly positive with pan B cell marker. We concluded that epiretinal membrane in Eels disease is an immune mediated process with predominant involvement of T lymphocytes. We had the opportunity to study histopathological, immunohistochemical and molecular biologic study of enucleated specimen of AS of Eels disease where the eye was thysical. This is the right eye was thysical and removed, left eye regressed Eels disease. When we studied the thysical eye with histopathology, we found neovascularization of the retina into the vitreous cavity with presence of lymphocytes in the perivascular spaces. These lymphocytes were CD CD8 positive T suppressor cells. We found nested and real-time PCR from paraffin section of that eyeball Mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA by nested and real time PCR. We also did intraocular expression of vascular endothelial growth factor and pigment epithelial derived factor by immunohistochemical study. We found strong expression of vascular endothelial growth factor and weak expression of pigment epithelial derived factor. Molecular biologic study of Eels disease was conducted by us in the vitreous epiretinal membrane and the eyeball. We found vitreous specimen pro obtained from the vitrectomy showed mycobacterium complex DNA in Eels disease. About 50% of the sample were positive for the mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. However, none of them were culture positive. With the help of Professor Madhavan, Director of our Microbiology and Molecular Biology, we studied Olimaristian reaction for the detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA in epiretinal membrane of Eels disease. We found 47% of epiretinal membrane in Eels disease was positive to mycobacterium tuberculosis genome. The difference was with the control was statistically significant. This is the agarose gel electrophotogram showing amplified products of the DNA of mycobacterium tuberculosis. We concluded the cell-mediated immunologic reaction triggered by sequestered mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen played an important role in pathogenesis of Eels disease. Subsequently, we had the opportunity to study a nucleated eyeball by polymeristian reaction of mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. We found in the paraffin section of the eyeball, mycobacterium tuberculosis was positive for the genome targeting MPV64 gene. With the, help of Professor, with the help of my fellow, Dr. Shishi Narayan, who is from Delhi, we did the profiling of human leukocyte antigens in Eels disease. 
we found higher frequency of human leukocyte antigen, HLA-B51, CW1, DR1, DR4, and DR52 found in the yeast disease patients in our country. We have concluded that HLA association in yeast disease occurs in the immunoregulation and pathogenesis. With the help of Dr. Prashad Gupta, who was an ex-resident of RP Center, we studied the association of latent mycobacterium tuberculosis in Eels disease. We found Montox positivity in 73% cases, quantiferent TB gold test positive in 56% cases, high resolution CT test was positive in 34% cases, and when there is a spillover anterior segment inflammation, aqueous PCR was positive in 33% cases, and vitreous specimen from vitrectomy was positive in 22% cases. We did study the imaging in the eels disease with ultra-wide field a fundus fluorescent angiogram showing capillary non-perfusion at the periphery much better detected. With the help of Aditi Agarwal, we did the study of white field, white field ultra imaging in eels disease. We found the optos photograph of the eye showing hemorrhages and periflobitis much better in uh, compared to the standard photography. And this is the retinal vasculitis in the periphery and corresponding fundus fluorescent angiogram. What I'm doing is the Swepsos optical coherence tomographic angiography in retinal vas vasculitis. We found elegantly new vascularization can be documented by Swepsos optical coherence tomography angiography. We want to also see the alteration of the vascular architecture and the capillary non-perfusion areas with Swepsos optical coherence tomographic angiography. We also could detect vascular looping and gross capillary non-perfusion in idiopathic retinal vasculitis, aneurysm, and neuroretinitis. We did the long-term outcome of a large cohort of patients with Eels disease comprising of 500 patients of 898 eyes which has followed up for 10 to 25 years with a mean follow-up of 15.8 years. Our major finding was bilaterality seen in 81% cases. In acute stage, oral steroid had a better prognosis. Laser treatment in proliferative stage had better prognosis. And recurrence was seen in 52% cases, more than five recurrence in 10 year span. We compiled our information and study results with 300 full text articles and analyzed the global data and wrote a major review in Survey of Ophthalmology in 2002. When we had the molecular biologic study results, we concluded in 2013 that the yeast disease should be considered as tubercular retinal vasculitis based on our molecular biologic study. However, several questions remain unanswered. Why females are mostly spared? Why the disease occurs in three stages? Why the vasculitis occurs exclusively in the eye? What about the etiology of PCR negative cases? The condition which can mimic Eels disease, the retinal vasculitis which can mimic Eels disease are sarcoidosis, base disease, and systemic lupus erythematosus. I'll be talking about retinal vasculitis with various diseases. Retinal vasculitis associated with uveitis, top on the list is Bessel's disease, sarcoidosis, syphilis, CMB retinitis, intermediate uveitis, and acute retinal necrosis. Bessel's disease has got a characteristic feature of aphthous ulcer and genital ulcer, sometimes can be accompanied by erythema nodosum. The fundus finding is quite characteristic with retinal vasculitis with exudates and vitritis. Sometimes optic disc involvement is seen. However, the um, uh, fundus fluorescent angiogram can have characteristic feature of articular leakage, which can be showing capillary farming as shown in this picture. Retinal vasculitis and sarcoidosis is uncommon, and we have seen only 4% cases in our study. These patients have hyalur lymphadenopathy on chest X-ray or high-resolution high CT chest. And when there is an extraocular manifestation like cervical lymphadenopathy, 
we found characteristic histopathologic evidence of non cageating granuloma infection associated with retinal vasculitis or tuberculosis cytomegalovirus retinitis toxoplasmosis syphilis acute retinal necrosis here is a case of cmb retinitis with retinal vasculitis we also showed retinal vasculitis in toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis here is a chylidiasis arterialis in a case of active toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis in active serpiginous choroiditis is uh, sorry serpiginous choroiditis with retinal vasculitis can be seen rarely one need to suspect tubercular etiology in such cases retinal vasculitis is an important component in acute retinal necrosis where there is a peripheral wedge shaped retinal necrosis is seen with retinal hemorrhages we did the histopathology on multi by molecular biologic study of an eyeball of a case of acute retinal necrosis 6 years after the onset and we could demonstrate retinal vascular occlusion as well as the chronic inflammation and viral inclusion body ocular syphilis can present rarely with retinal vasculitis we showed that in syphilitic uveitis vitreous exudates can be accompanied with retinal vasculitis as seen in this picture several collagen diseases can be associated with retinal vasculitis which include systemic lupus erythematosus granulomatosis with polyangiitis which was earlier known as the wegner's granulomatosis polyarthritis nodosa we studied the retinal involvement in systemic lupus erythematosus where we have seen active vasculitis in 27% cases and healed retinal vasculitis in 23% cases here is an example of retinal vasculitis with cotinol exudates and by the systemic findings of bilateral symmetrical malar rash even a fluorescent study with positive anti ds dna was characteristic we also studied various diseases presenting as frosted branch angiitis we reported bilateral frosted branch angiitis in a 8 year old indian girl with due to rubella which responded with a course of oral steroid we described the unilateral frosted branch angiitis in a patient with biopsy proven abdominal tuberculosis other i had healed tuberculoma of the choroid this patient responded nicely with a course of antitubercular treatment and steroid we have also described bilateral frosted branch angiitis and cytomegalovirus retinitis in acquired immunodeficiency syndrome here is the frosted branch angiitis on the temporal side you can see the cytomegalovirus retinitis we also described non infective conditions like sympathetic ophthalmia presented with frosted branch angiitis frosted branch angiitis we concluded that is a sign only can occur in various retinal diseases retinal vasculitis with neurologic disease can be presented with multiple sclerosis and here is a case which we have described recurrent anterior uveitis and healed retinal vasculitis associated with multiple sclerosis where where memory scan showed hyper intense signal in the posterior limb of the internal capsule and corona radiata and peripheral vascular sheathing of the retinal vessels how about the investigations of uh, retinal vasculitis cases how do we approach we feel and recommend tailored and focused laboratory investigation and step wise approach we found that in our series of 70 patients and 113 eyes although mantuk test was positive in 30% cases and ray serum ac level and ana level were for 5.7% cases each the none of the total 70 patients had unequivocal systemic disease management of the retinal vasculitis can be in, if infective we need to treat the infection first however when there is a primary or associated with the autoimmune disease systemic steroid is the mainstay of treatment if non responsive one need to switch to immunosuppressive agents in addition in ills disease management we recommend treatment with the corticosteroid and antitubercular treatment 
based on our molecular biologic study. In neovascularization, we recommend laser photocoagulation. In vitreous hemorrhage and fractional retinal detachment, vitrectomy with or without endolaser is recommended. This is an example of active retinal vasculitis in a case of Eels disease, which was positive with Mantox test, quantifier on TB gold test, and high resolution CT test. With the course of antitubercular treatment and steroid, patient vasculitis responded elegantly. However, in Bessage disease, we feel immunosuppressive agents are the first choice. Here is an example of retinal vasculitis rest of a Bessage disease responding with cyclosporine treatment in three months period. We have now switching over to biologics in retinal vasculitis, in particular, recalcitrant retinal vasculitis and Bessex disease. We have shared our experience of biological therapy in refractory cases of uveitis and scleritis, where we have demonstrated a case of Bessex disease, which was treated with a subcutaneous injection of adalimumab, a biologic agent, showing marked resolution of inflammation and retinal vasculitis. In conclusion, I like to mention that Eels disease is a T cell mediated immunologic reaction to mycobacterial tuberculosis DNA in genetically predisposed patients. Ultra white field imaging is beneficial to document peripheral vascular changes in Eels disease and can help in the management. Retinal vasculitis can be associated with various ocular and systemic diseases. Frosted branch angitis is a sign only and not a separate disease. Management of retinal vasculitis depends on the etiology. Systemic steroid works in majority of the cases. However, immunosuppressive or biologics are beneficial in recalcitrant retinal vasculitis and in Bessette's disease. I like to come back to the same quotation which I have said in the beginning. The known is finite, the unknown is infinite. Intellectually, we stand on an islet in the midst of ocean of inexplicability. Our business in every generation is to reclaim a little more land. In the last three decades, what I have tried is to reclaim a little more land. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. My TV, your lecture is par excellence. It's amazing. It's so nice to be in an academic atmosphere right now because it's so exciting. And what you've told us is things which we knew, but many of the things probably still things which we never knew. And the way you've told us your three years, your three decades of experience is really wonderful. I hope the residents get to learn from you. And uh, Shankar and Krala, and you are really at the forefront of these diseases. And uh, it's uh, hats off to you the way, kind of work, how you worked and strived in these three decades. And you brought out so much. I mean, you've done, gone down to basic research, to clinical work, and it's the amount of work you've done is a, uh, it's like inspiring for the younger generation, I'm sure, because I, I got excited listening to you in the sense that it's, Nice to interact with people like you, you know. And I uh, hope everybody understands that kind of a feeling which I have. And uh, I would love to... Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your kind words. I'm sure you'll be at Kolkata. Yeah, you'll be at Kolkata and I'd like to meet you. And, yes, you know, sure. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Cup of sure. Coffee or tea. sure, sure. Keep some time for me at uh, Kolkata. Sure, sure. We'd like to meet you. Yeah. look forward to meeting you in Kolkata. Yeah, I'll call you in the evening. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. For a lovely, wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we move ahead to the next oration. And that is after our founding father, the Professor L.P. Garbal oration. You know, he was the father of RP Center and also the father of modern Indian ophthalmology. And in his honor, we keep this professor LPR oration every year. This year, 
there is a world renowned retinal specialist who is getting this oration professor adnan sofail he is a consultant ophthalmologist at the moorfields eye hospital london and also a professor of ophthalmology at the institute of ophthalmology university college of london he led the first rct for avastin therapy and the first independent study to validate the available artificial intelligence algorithms to detect diabetic eye disease he is the deputy lead of the macu star consortium for the validation of endpoints for dry age related macular degeneration he has also co-founded the special interest group at arvo on big data and he is part of the retinal research group at ucl that brings together vascular biologists clinicians and data scientists to improve our understanding of retinal disorders so a world renowned specialist a top researcher in the field of retinal biology and he'll be delivering the prestigious professor lp garwal oration we welcome professor adnan tofail over to the online oration Huge privilege and honor for me to deliver the LP Agarwal oration for 2021 on the subject of real-world outcomes in patients with neovascular AMD treated with anti-VEGF injections. Um, although um, LP Agarwal was mainly focused on research in the anterior segment, he had a, a prodigious uh, research output that included. Uh, papers in retina, which is my focus of interest. And we have strong connections between our institutions. Uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital is a place where LP Agarwal spent some time during his uh, training in ophthalmology and probably under the uh, tutorship of Benjamin Mycroft. Uh, an eminent cornea lacrimal surgeon before returning to India, Lucknow to finish his training and then setting up the eye unit at AIM. So I'm gonna talk about real world outcomes and I became interested in real world outcomes when we started having uh, the ability to deliver ranibizumab on the NHS um, in about 2008, where it was funded for patients with neovascular AMD. However, the payers um, on the NHS felt that we ought to deliver this uh, treatment to, and get the outcomes of the pivotal Ancra Marina trials, where patients were treated on a continuous monthly basis. But as we all know in real life, um, it's difficult to see patients at regular intervals. There could be capacity problems. Elderly patients have intercurrent diseases and may not be able to turn up on time. And we may treat patients outside the strict entry criteria of the original clinical trials. So my initial foray into this area was purely to see how well we were doing and set a benchmark. So the, the government that were paying for ranibizumab um, would understand what value for the drug. So I'm going to divide this talk into three parts, um, how we generate the data, focusing on electronic medical records, but also touch later in the talk on imaging data and genetics, etc. Then about no, uh, how we analyze the data and how these data are changing policy and using it to drive uh, novel. So electronic medical records in many people's eyes, are a, um, a glorified uh, dumping ground of data. Although they seem more convenient than paper records, um, they will inevitably slow your clinic down. And in many cases, these are glorified billing systems. However, there are good EMR systems in the UK, which are designed to analyze and uh, monitor how well you are doing in managing your patients. And um, at the time we initially started the study in 2012, there were two EMRs that had a structured data collection 
of uh, age, ETRS, injection episodes, complications, and some OCT uh, analyzed data. So this is akin to rather like an electronic case report form in a clinical trial where when you start uh, going down the AMD route, there are a minimum data set you must enter. And the initial aim was to provide real world outcomes, benchmark therapy, but also to use these data to guide future, um, uh, explore the data in a novel way and guide, guide future studies. So in our initial attempt at doing this, almost 10 years ago, we invited um, 16 centers and uh, within two months, we got uh, the ethics approval and uh, data from the 14 out of 16 centers uh, to um, export the data from the, the Medisoft EMR system onto the research servers at Moorfields. And this was of uh, over 11,000 patients, over 92,000 ranibizumab injections, uh, over 330,000 follow-up visits and 2.8 million data items. And this was our first attempt at doing this, collecting all this data within two months. In contrast, the previous attempt at audit trawling through paper notes. You can see even uh, almost 10 years ago, the power of this potential approach. Um, we published the initial papers on basic outcomes in ophthalmology. And uh, as expected, unlike the clinical trials, patients um, had entry criteria well outside the clinical trials, patients starting on ranibizumab at the age of 108. So you'd expect not to get the clinical outcomes you would get in the pivotal trials. Um, <clears throat> this is the, on the left is the um, outcome of the MARINA trial. This is the treaty group and the sham arm. Um, showing the sustained visual gain with monthly ranibizumab. In contrast, in real life, we showed this initial gain, and then at two years, it drops below the baseline. So we weren't doing as well um, as the pivotal trials. However, we were doing this with far fewer injections than the monthly uh, inject mandated injections in the pivotal trial and with less visits. So we weren't getting sustained visual gains. We were much better than the sham arm, but with far, far fewer injections. So not doing perfectly, but not doing terribly. But this was now the benchmark um, to which the payers would understand what uh, treatment standards were. So Given we weren't getting the sort of visual gains as the Anchor Marina trial, the sort of questions we wanted to answer was if a patient improved by four letters after loading, is this suboptimal or is this good? What does real world evidence tell us? So the average patient in Anchor gained uh, 10 letters with, if they had a classic lesion. So how well are we doing with a four letter gain? There is a level of complexity to the question, how, how much visual gain would you expect? So this is the slide I've already shown you of mean change in visual acuity for the 11,000 patients. But because we have so much data, we can split this line up into uh, cohorts of eyes uh, based on starting visual acuity. And each color on these lines is a different subgroup of, of these eyes based on 15 letter subgroups of visual acuity. And the conventional way of thinking in this plot of change in visual acuity from baseline is the purple patients are the ones that we think are doing extremely well and the red ones are doing badly. However, that's the conventional way of thinking about this until we publish these papers. But actually if we plot the data instead of change from baseline as absolute visual acuity, the eyes with the greatest gain are the eyes with the worst visual acuity at baseline. And the eyes that were dropping from, from baseline were the ones with the best visual acuity. And, and the average patient doesn't cross into different groups. So if you start with good visual acuity, 
uh, a four letter gain is actually a phenomenal uh, result given the average patient would actually slightly drop vision. But a four letter gain with very bad starting visual acuity would not necessarily be a good result. So the visual gain is conditional on starting visual acuity. But what's most important to the patients uh, function in daily life is visual acuity state, not gain. So you're better off losing a couple of letters, starting with good vision and maintaining driving vision than starting with bad vision, gaining a bit, but still being uh, legally sight impaired. So as we've seen, we, we get all these visual acuities and then they seem to aggregate together. And one of the criticism was, is this what's called a regression to the mean effect? This is originally was described in families with um, uh, looking at heights of their children. And the, it was noted that people with the tall people would have tall children, but maybe not as tall as the parents, and they regress towards the mean. So if you have a really good um, cricket score in one innings, your next innings will probably regress towards your mean and not, not be as good. And if you have a terrible innings with it out for a duck, the next innings would probably be closer to your mean. So how did we answer this question? We actually were fortunate to go back to the original anchor and marina data and be able to compare these subgroups of visual acuities by starting vision to their respective untreated sham arm. So the blues, the reds, and the blacks are pairs of treated and sham through each cohort of starting visual acuities in the original anchor and marina study. And this is work we published in the BJO last year. And actually the delta between treated and untreated is very similar. So although you may not gain much vision with good starting visual acuity, your net benefit in letters compared to no treatment is actually pretty similar in each of the strata. But what's more, um, what's also adds to a level of complexity is although these subgroups look very clean, if we look at how individual patients make up each of these lines of different starting visual acuities, although the mean and standard error plots look very tight, individual patient profiles are signified by these red, these colored lines that make up the mean standard error shows how variable real individual patients are compared to the average. So there's a level of complexity about uh, personalized uh, medicine and personalized trajectories that is still difficult. And this is my, one of my current areas of interest is how to determine which patients follow which individual trajectory. We, given the huge ends, uh, we can look at with quite tight confidence at what the risk of second eye uh, wet AMD is if a patient presents needing treatment in the first eye and has dry AMD in the second eye with good vision in the second eye. And in fact, the risk of second eye involvement is higher than predicted by ARIDS in this study with 50% developing second eye wet AMD at about three years. Um, we've done a more recent study presented at Euretna um, where we say, are we getting better at treating wet AMD since it was introduced on the NHS 12 years ago? a cohort study of 42,000 patients uh, in collaboration with 27 UK centre collaborators, which I'm very grateful for their input in sharing the data. And the idea was to look at um, successive cohorts of three-year follow-up and also a long-term follow-up on the initial cohort for over 10 years. And this is what happens. This is a lowest regression plot and what we see is they're actually reasonably parallel. And the graphs, the lines at the top are the newer cohorts, the lines at the bottom are the older cohorts starting in 20, uh, 2008 with three years follow up. So, what you can see very quickly from this graph is that we're doing similarly, but we are starting with better visions but the tail off is pretty similar over time. Even though we are giving more, a higher ratio of injections per visit, suggesting we are moving possibly more from a PRN 
to a mixture of continuous injection since ILEA came in or uh, treat and extend. We are um, maintaining uh, a higher proportion of eyes in driving vision, but we have a similar proportion with uh, sight impairment. And a similar um, pro um, change proportion of eyes that have a five or more letter loss, and that hasn't really improved. Um, a other way of analyzing this with a logistic regression model initially shows that we are getting better visual outcomes in successive cohorts since 2008, i.e. we are treating better. But if we take into the account baseline visual acuity, which has improved over the years in a multivariate analysis, the year of treatment initiation is not relevant to the outcome. So the biggest driver for improved vision in the UK is actually because we're catching the patients earlier and treating them earlier. Although I've talked about the UK EMR, uh, mainly from an EMR called Medisoft that has wonderfully granular data, there are other data sources in other countries, such as the IRIS registry, that has a huge uh, number of patients. But um, most of this is in free text format. So it's much harder to analyze and has uh, certain limitations in data quality. I'm now interested in linking um, data to other sources such as imaging, visual fields, um, and genetics data that I'll talk about at the end of the talk. Uh, eventually, we assume that the electronic medical records will capture all patient episodes in the UK, um, and this can allow um, massive rapid post-marketing surveillance. Um, and then when we can integrate this with general hospital EMR data, uh, this could well be the future of phase four trials that so will get systemic plus local data. Talking a bit about um, how we can analyze these data in a novel way once we've captured it. Um, as uh, unlike a clinical trial, we capture binocular visual acuities. We can look at um, uh, uh, how rates of blindness and sight impairment have changed over the years. And um, uh, blindness is a binocular function, so we can look at the, the, the um, acuity of the better seeing eye, and we can see that we are getting better year on year on these Kaplan-Meier plots in terms of um, time to uh, sight, a severe sight impairment. One of the things we're also interested in, and something that the UK does particularly well, is look at variations of care. So all um, hospital cataract surgeons have to return an audit to look at how what their capsular rupture rate is in relation to the national average. And this is often plotted on something called a funnel plot, which is um, uh, the number of treatments done and then uh, your confidence interval and where you lie within that. So we plotted um, the centers um, submitting data in a funnel plot and showed how many patients would be outside in AMD on a number of different metrics. As I've said, uh, visual gain is not necessarily a good metric because that depends on where you start. But actually a good holistic metric is say maintaining driving vision because that not only um, involves having regular sustained treatment to stop visual drop, but also capturing the patient early uh, at a level um, where you can maintain vision in the driving standard. So this funnel plot, for example, is the um, where each center sits at maintaining uh, driving vision uh, at 12 months. But just we're also interested in how the UK is doing compared to other countries, not just between center to center within the UK. Um, and I was part of a ICHOM group to develop a minimum data set that you could capture on a sophisticated electronic record system like I've showed, or even an Access or Excel spreadsheet. And so if we all capture the same data structures, we can e more easily compare and look at standardized outcomes and improve our outcomes globally. For example, we compared um, Australian outcomes from Mark Gillies' group and this is the lowest regression line that um, from private practice Australia. 
um, that may overestimate um, the, the benefit in a true population compared to a uh, hospital-wide NHS population. Mark Gillies um, Australian private practice data is treat and extend, and this is uh, PRN data that was captured up to about 2012-2013, showing uh, initially uh, superficially better outcomes from Australia than the UK, uh, with not a lot more extra injections, and this has helped influence changes in practice in the UK. Again, we have binocular data, and what's interesting as we move towards treat and extend, it seems to get a better real-world outcome. Um, if the other eye is untreated and you're extending to a longer follow-up, say a 12-week plus follow-up, then you're seeing the fellow eye less often. And one of the concerns raised by my colleague Ben Burton was, well, if you see the, uh, see the patient less often, you're checking the fellow eye less often, and would it then present with worse visual acuity? And in fact, um, we analyzed this, and he is correct, that the second eye um, um, visual acuity is worse um, the greater the length of follow-up for the first eye. So the red is visual acuity pre-treatment in the fellow eye, the blue is visual acuity post-treatment. As you extend the first eye out, your presenting visual acuity is on average worse. And I've already mentioned that the biggest driver for, for good visual function is your baseline visual acuity. Um, and so this needs to be taken into account, especially when we start going towards long acting anti-VEGFs. Um, we've looked at switching therapy and we've looked at what happens in a cohort of eyes where you switch from Lucentis to uh, uh, Aflibercept and, and have a match group. So the, the eyes you switch are ones that are declining, so we had a match declining group when you switch, there's initial flurry of increased injections, but after that initial flurry, you um, and then get back to where you were. So we didn't find any sustained benefit from switching drugs for the average eye. And my Australian colleagues have found similar, similar findings. And we're also looking at some very clever use of real world, drug, uh, real world data in synthetic clinical trials. And this is something we've just published in a US clinical pharmacology journal led by my colleague, Darren Thomas. Um, the clinical trials are expensive and time consuming uh, because you, especially in the early phase clinical trials, you need to uh, recruit both the active and control arms and you have to pay for, the, for this more complex trial. Um, and roughly one in four ophthalmology early phase trials are single armed anyway. And the trouble is making informed decisions to go to later stage clinical trials. In oncology, they've used what's called synthetic control arms, where there is good data for a standardized intervention you'd like to compare it to. And the FDA in the States have now actually um, used such synthetic control arms where you match in complex ways their baseline kind of characteristics to help approval uh, for oncology and rare disease uh, treatments. And so we wanted to explore whether we could um, use such approach in ophthalmology. And we used the, the data from my original Avastin randomized controlled trial, which is the first randomized controlled trial for Avastin, which where it was compared against vert vertiporphin photodynamic therapy and macugen before ranibizumab was even licensed, and compared it to a Flibercept three uh, injections uh, and then uh, two monthly. And we did some multiple different matching arms, um, exact matching, inverse probability weighting, and propensity score matching, um, which is uh, the property of being in the uh, uh, ABC trial conditional on confounding variables and applying that to the synthetic arm. And we found uh, with an intention to treatment analysis that uh, bevacizumab would be non-inferior to aflibercept as expected. Um, and um, the this implications of synthetic clinical trials would be potential to accelerate early phase clinical trials um, where the treatment is well standardized like treatment for anti-VEGF and that will reduce the cost and accelerate uh, recruitment for clinical trial. And this, uh, this is uh, now published data. 
we've gone beyond just AMD and um, we have huge amounts of data for say diabetic retinopathy and we can look at progression rates of diabetic retinopathy in real world to proliferative disease and these are caprimiacus each color being um, the rate of progression to proliferative uh, based on a baseline uh, diabetic retinopathy grade. So this is really helpful in guiding uh, intervals between seeing patients. Um, the advantage of using EMR data, we can go beyond simply um, outcomes of one uh, intervention. Um, during a cataract list a number of years ago, I observed a very good resident having um, vitreous loss despite what seemed to be a flawless operation when they were doing the IA. And this happened again uh, a few weeks later. And I noted that both these patients had 30, 40, 50 injections. And we thought, well, actually, even though there's no obvious direct trauma from an intravitreal injection, does it cause micro trauma? Would it increase the risk of doing getting PCR rupture? Given the huge amount of data we got, we could uh, model this out. And indeed, um, our, the hypothesis was correct. And um, for um, every intravitreal injection, there's a finite increase in the risk of PCR rupture. And when you have uh, 10 or more intravitreal injections, um, this becomes significant to the level of, a, um, of increasing your risk um, uh, several fold. Finally, I'd like, like to go on how we can use this data to alter public policy. Um, we used real world data in combination with the ARID clinical trial data um, run by the National Eye Institute to say, is uh, using ARID supplement cost effective? So we can look at what the chances of using ARID at the at-risk population in the UK, preventing the onset of neovascular AMD or not, and then the cost of real-world treatment and the outcomes of real-world treatment. We showed that for ARID group three, where you have neovascular AMD in one eye, and intermediate AMD in the fellow eye, giving the ARIDS vitamins out free, i.e. the state pays for it, would actually save the state money because it would prevent wet AMD and the cost of treating wet AMD. So we're looking at hybrid models of real world data with health economics and clinical trial data. But finally, I'm going to talk about the exciting area uh, that we're now moving into. One of the challenges we had is knowing what happened when, when a patient's really on a treatment extend or not having a true treatment extend, because that depends on whether the retina is dry or not, whether the interval uh, was correctly decided. So in our more recent data extraction of from 27 centers of 170,000 retina patients, we've linked it in a subset of centers to 42 million retinal images, OCT slices, et cetera. And we're now linking a subgroup to genetic data, this over a billion data points. But when we have this number of images, um, that's too much for humans to analyze and be too expensive for a reading center. And so we've been working with various groups to develop uh, AI algorithms to, that would read these images. And this is uh, the latest iteration that we published recently, the American Journal of Ophthalmology, led by Clarissa Sanchez Gutierrez's group in uh, Nijmegen, Amsterdam, with her PhD student. And this is the result. It, this is a deep learning algorithm that will not just identify, but quantify 13 key features of AMD, the neovascular uh, features such as interretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, PEDs, the, the, the dry AMD features, drusen hyperreflectivity, and pre-GA features such as OPL descent and ellipsoid zone loss. So really, I think this represents the state of the art. Um, and we, these are the number of images we use to train and validate it. And this shows the output of the AI algorithm. These are the four retina expert interpretations showing it's an, um, a good aggregate that's better than individual graders for many of these features. And this just shows the algorithm at uh, in action, showing if you you can highlight each individual feature, and it will show as you go through the raster what it's identifying of each of these features. 
So a very powerful tool that allows us to analyze. And now we, we can link to the EMR longitudinally and look at changes in each of these features longitudinally and how that relates to treatment. This can be incredibly powerful going forward. And um, we will use this um, AI deep learning software to integrate into, hopefully to integrate into future clinical devices, reduce reading center burn, burden and clinical burden in busy cl injection clinics, and hopefully um, develop better predictive biomarker models. And we love to integrate it into home OCT devices, such as this one uh, called the MIMO, developed by my colleague Peter Malocca, where a patient puts their head on um, this device here, they put their arms around it, and in 1.8 seconds, it scans both the eyes. The top scan here is the MIMO OCT. The bottom is a high-end uh, commercial co available commercial device linked to AI that tells the patient whether they've got a recurrence and alerts them to come back to the clinic. So in summary, um, we have a wealth of real-world big data, um, and we hope eventually we'll get national coverage. Uh, we, we're aiming to inform personalized medicine um, and um, we're using, uh, using these large data sets both to train AI and to analyze the data to answer very important clinical questions. I'd just like to thank um, the organizers again for the kind invitation to give this um, important um, and prestigious oration and to all my collaborators in the UK uh, uh, the US and uh, Holland who have made this work possible. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Tufail. That was really a mind-blowing presentation on the use of AI. So now, uh, Professor Tufail has joined us live and I hand over to Professor Atul Kumar, Chief RP Center for the discussion. Morning, Adnan. Your morning. Can you hear me? Morning, morning. You, you, UK time. UK time. Yes, it's morning here. Yes. Can you what hear time, me? Okay. Is it, there? it is ten fifty. Okay. Okay. We're around we're four, four fifty. Good. Four, four, four p.m. in the afternoon. Wonderful. I know you. I know you. So, so uh, uh, it's a wonderful oration, and we very lucid, very. Useful, very, I think the residents also learned a lot and I did learn a lot. And you're always there for our Indian uh, VRSI meetings and this, you agreed for this oration was a big honor for us. It's an enormous honor for me, given the connection between our institutions and uh, um, uh, just a, a wonderful meeting. Thank you. I know you also have any, you're half Indian, so you have a connection. Uh, so yes, so my parents are Punjabi, so double connection with uh, LP Agrawal spending time at Moorfield and my parents hailing from Amritsar and Ludhiana. Excellent. So we, I hope we keep in touch with uh, each other and uh, I think your oration has really opened our eyes to many new things. The EMR, EMR data, we can analyze our, ourselves here and we should also, you know, Try to bring out some uh, trials and also uh, interact with you more so that we can, you know. I, I would love to work with you on, on such ventures. Uh, I think if you unleash the power of good data collection in the population the size of India, right. the things that you could answer would be amazing. I loved hearing to Dr. Biswas's lecture. One of the other things we're working on is EMRs for uveitis, which is a very complex disorder. And I think that could answer some really interesting questions. Yes. I think we're really honored to have world class, world famous retina specialist with us here just now. And you can't imagine the amount of uh, excitement we have here to have you online and, you know, to listen to you live and it may never come again so early. So I, I think the residents and everybody else, the faculty are excited that you come on live. Good spare time in your, of your very, very busy, busy schedule. Thank you again. Huge honor is mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that, we bring the scientific uh, program of the 54th Foundation Day to a close. And now with the permission of GFRP Center, we have arranged a beautiful treat 
so all the residents will all be delicacies both sweet salt and to drink something so we all invite you all of you to the first floor thank you very much thank you sir thank you we, we also have arrangement by the side of the auditorium in the garden